make sure that's recording. It says we're recording. Okay. In case there are any connectivity issues, um, that way, if you get disconnected, you can still uh, still watch the lecture. Um, okay. So today, uh, well, let's let's take a look at where we are at. So. Uh, and let me pull up the chat as well in case there are any questions so I can see those. Okay, so if you scroll down on Web Campus, um, scroll down to basically the very end here. Um, let's see here, week 13. This was uh, the week before Thanksgiving. So this was, um, uh, day 25, I don't remember what our lecture was. That day was the last day of lecture before um, before the review. Day 26, November 19th, that was our review. Um, week 14, uh, that was our, our exam was on Tuesday and th uh, Thursday was then uh, the Thanksgiving uh, recess. So we're on week 15 here. This I add, this module I added this morning. Uh, so on the page here, if you click on the page, uh, this will have the review for the final exam. This week is going to be a review for the final exam, uh, both today and, and Thursday. That's what we'll be going through. Uh, so I have the study guide linked here, as well as a recipe that is from the study guide that we'll be using. Um, and uh, when, when we are finished with this lecture and the lecture notes that will be on this page as well. So uh, that's what this page is for. Um, I would recommend if you are able to, to uh, open up the study guide here and follow along. Um, of course, you are welcome to download it and print it if you, you know, <laughs> for your own studies. Um, but it would be probably best if you did uh, at least follow along. Uh, if, if you're not downloading it, at least uh, pull it up. So that's where the study guide for the final is found. Uh, and then on the, the uh, last page or the uh, last file in that module, as soon as this loads, is going to be used on problem uh, problem five of the exam. So this this is for problem five of the exam, uh, not of the exam, of the final review <laughs> of the uh, exam review. So be using this on problem five. Um, as a note, I, I did uh, update the test three scores. I put those on Web Campus, and I have gone through. Um, I have gone through all of the uh, scratch paper that was sent, um, that was sent to me, and some points were given possibly for, well, points were given for for uh, progress towards the correct answer. If you haven't sent me your, your scratch work, uh, please do so as uh, soon as possible. Um, so just just be aware that that has been that has been posted on on Web Campus now. Um, so before we jump into the review, I guess I should ask, are there any any questions on any of the material or homework before we jump into the into the review? And as always, you can use either the audio or the or the chat. There is a little bit of a delay. So I know you might be typing still. That's fine. If I see a question, I'll answer it. But it doesn't seem there's, that there are any questions. So let's go ahead and start with the, oh, uh, homework. There should not have been any homework that was due this last weekend. No, um, since this last weekend was just the exam. All right, so then let's go ahead and jump into the review then.
So this is, again, the exam for the, the study guide for the final. The final exam is cumulative, which means anything that, uh, that we discussed um, for the semester could be potentially on the final exam. I would pay uh, the most attention to this review, this uh, study guide, as well as to the, uh, the practice final exam that will be posted on Pearson as well. So those two things I would definitely focus on. Um, if you have extra time, do you want to study, uh, if you need more study material, uh, it's always a good idea to go through, because this is for the final exam, to go through the study guides we had for test one, test two, and test three, as well as go through those exams and make sure you know how to, how to, uh, how to do all of those, all of those problems, which while I'm thinking about it, let me, let me uh, mention this while I was thinking about it. So um, the Pearson didn't seem to uh, have as as many of the advantages that I was hoping it would. I couldn't post any of the any images on it, uh, like for our formula formula uh, bar that we had. Um, and I think there were a few other input issues. Um, so I was thinking it might be a little bit easier to use Web Campus for the final exam. Um, how would you guys feel about using Web Campus for the final instead of Pearson? Uh, the setup would be the same uh, or similar, but on Web Campus instead. Any thoughts on that or not seeing any? Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, yeah, you would, as um, for the final exam, and I'll probably send this out in an email um, this week, uh, you will be able to get points back uh, for work towards the correct answer, just like on, on this last test. Uh, you just have to send me your, your scratch work as well for the final, but yeah, that would, it would be, it would be similar to that, yeah. So I'm seeing some feedback on that. Let's let's plan on using Web Campus, um, Web Campus instead. Uh, but I I will send out an email um, with that information. Uh, probably tomorrow or Thursday. Okay, so let's go ahead and and jump into the the review then. Um, so just as before, this has the uh, the section number. Uh, that, the, that the exercise comes from. This is section 1A. Also has exercises in that section. So these, uh, this one, you would be looking at exercises 11 through 20 in, in the back of the book. Uh, so let's just start at the top and work our way through. Um, okay, so this, the problem one, we're looking at analyzing fallacies. Uh, so Actually, problem one, I wanted to do a different one besides this argument. I keep forgetting to remove, to change that on my, on my end. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you the argument here in just a moment. What we want to do is identify the premise or premises. Remember, there can be more than one premise uh, and the conclusion of the argument. Uh, we want to identify the fallacy and then make up an argument that exhibits the same fallacy. So let's go to our digital paper. And uh, just like for the um, for the previous exam, I don't know what I did there, okay. Uh, for the previous exam, no, for the final exam, it's going to be very similar to the previous exam in that um, what you will need to know for that is going to be the same as what you needed to know. What you need to know for the final is the same as what you needed to know for those, for test one, test two, test three. And you'll be uh, given those uh, formulas that you were, you're provided on, on those exams as well. So it's, it's not gonna be anything too different from that. It's just kind of like uh, all of the, all three exams put together. So let's 
let's remind ourselves of the fallacies that we have. Uh, so there are, there are many, many different types of fallacies. Uh, but in, in our case, we only talked about uh, 10 of those. Uh, so we have 10 fallacies that we were looking at. And the 10 fallacies, let me give them to you in the same order that we had. So these were the, the 10 fallacies that we are focusing on. We had the 10 common fallacies. Let's see, the first one was appeal to popularity. Second was false cause. Third is appeal to ignorance. Fourth, hasty generalization. Uh, fifth, limited choice. Sixth, appeal to emotion. Seventh, personal attack. Eighth, circular reasoning. Ninth, diversion. And tenth, straw man. So those were our fallacies uh, that we had. Again, there, there are many other types of fallacies, but these are the 10 that we are focusing on in this course. Uh, so what we want to do for this one, I'm going to look at uh, exercise 12. This is on page 12, and this was section 1A. So let's look at problem 12. And I think I have to readjust. Uh, yeah, let me readjust that. All right. So I'm looking at problem 12. In the book, this is page 12. The argument is I became sick just hours after eating at Burger Hut. So its food must have made me sick. OK. So that's the argument that I wanted to look at instead of the one on the review. So the first thing we want to do is identify the premise or premises and uh, then identify the conclusion. All right, so let's look at what is the premise or premises. Remember, we can have multiple premises. And what is the conclusion? Uh, personally, I think finding the conclusion is a, is a little bit easier. Since the conclusion is what you are arguing, it's what you want to uh, convince the other person of. Whereas the premise or premises, that is what you are using as your evidence for the conclusion. So here, what is the conclusion for this uh, given argument? Good, yes, so the conclusion is that the food made me sick. And so the premise, what we're using as evidence is that we became sick hours after eating, just hours after eating. So using that as evidence, we became sick 
hours after. Okay, uh, so that's the first part that we were looking for, identify the premises and the conclusion. Uh, briefly describe the fallacy. So let's look at what fallacy has been made. So looking at this list, what fallacy have we, uh, what fallacy do we have in this argument? And we can mark some off almost immediately. Appeal to popularity, it's not going to be, there's no uh, popularity there. Appeal to ignorance, we're not using uh, hasty generalization. Uh, it's not appeal to emotion or personal attack. Circular reasoning, diversion, or straw man. So we have a few possibilities here. Um, in this case, So it looks like we are down to either false cause or limited choice. So limited choice is when uh, you are limiting the options of the other person that if, um, if you do not do something or if you do not think something, then you must do or think uh, something else where there is a third case. False cause, I believe is what we are looking at here, false cause. Uh, here we are assuming that because we ate before we got sick, just hours before, uh, then that is what made us sick. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a false cause fallacy. Um, let's see here. False cause, and I see a question. Uh, will the fallacies be listed? Oh yes, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. The fallacies will be listed. Um, if you remember on, on exam one, uh, it was uh, uh, matching the fallacy to the argument. Um, it might be something like that on the exam. Um, if not, the fallacies will be listed. Yep. So you don't have to memorize the names. You do have to, of course, know which one uh, what what uh, each one is in terms of its structure, but you don't have to memorize the names. Um, that's a good question. Okay, uh, so then this one is a false cause fallacy. We are assuming that because we became sick after eating, that the food is what made us sick. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, and then the last part, make of an argument uh, that exhibits the same fallacy. So we want to come up with an example that has the same fallacy. Um, I'm going to throw that to you guys. Uh, does anyone have a, a false cause argument that they would like to present? No takers on the on an example. Okay. Um, oh, oh, there we go. It was it was just a delay in chat. Here we let's, right, let's see what we got. Oh, that's a good one. Yep. Uh, so. Uh, my hair started falling out after I used a new conditioner. The conditioner made my hair fall out. That is a good one. Uh, let's see. I, <laughs> that's that's a good one too. I ate donuts for breakfast and was late for work, so the donuts made me late. Uh, I saw a black cat and got a bad grade. The black cat was the cause of the bad grade. That's yep. That would work. Every time I. Okay, so that that's close. That that's the so you have the the premise there. Every time I go to sleep, the sun goes down. So my sleeping causes the sun to go down. That would be the 
the conclusion there. Yep, those all are perfect examples. Very good, very good. Okay. Uh, and then we also have, uh, I believe when we went through the fallacies, I gave you an example in class as well. Uh, so you're welcome to use those examples if you can't think of any. Um, so there is problem one. All right, excellent. Let's go back to our review page. That was problem one, problem two. Uh, so here we're using a Venn diagram to analyze relationships. Uh, so what do we want to do? We want to construct a Venn diagram and, and then answer the question. Uh, so here, actually, we're also going to uh, have a, a middle step, which is to uh, make a two-way table, uh, which is also what we had before. So let's go ahead and read through this. Then we'll make a two-way table and then use the two-way table to create the Venn diagram and answer the question. So we have a, a trial of a new vaccine. 100 people were given the vaccine and 50 were given a placebo. Of those given the medicine, that should say vaccine. Sorry about that. Uh, 80 never developed symptoms. Of those given the placebo, 10 never developed symptoms. We wanna make a Venn diagram for the results, okay. So uh, what we did in class, what we're going to do um, for the final as well, is we're going to first make a two-way table. So first, we're going to make a two-way table. And if you recall, the two-way table, it was called that because we had two variables. Um, our first variable, or another way to think of it, uh, if this was a survey after the study was completed, the survey would have two questions. And each question is a, is a variable. So the first question that we would ask is, were you given the, the vaccine or the placebo? So that's our first variable. So we have vaccine or placebo. The second question and the second variable is, uh, did you develop symptoms or have no symptoms? So we'd have symptoms or no symptoms. Okay. So when we make our two-way table, we put one variable uh, as a row, one variable as a column. Uh, so let's put the uh, first one as our row. So we have vaccine, we have placebo, and I also want to include a total uh, for both of these. Uh, the book does not, but I think it helps in making sure things line up. So I would recommend including it, but the book does not, just for some reasons. So on the second uh, variable columns, we have symptoms, no symptoms, and total. So here is our two-way table, and again, it's the it's called a two-way table because we're looking at two variables on this table. Okay. And so now we're going to use the information that we were given to fill out the table. So we look at the first uh, sentence. In a, new tra in, a new, in a trial of a new vaccine, 100 people were given the vaccine and 50 were given a placebo. So uh, the total number that were given the vaccine is 100. And 50 were given the placebo. So the total given the placebo is 50. And so from this first sentence, we know that the total number of individuals in this trial is 150. So we have 150 individuals that were participating in this trial of this vaccine. Okay, let's go to the second sentence. Of those given the vaccine, 80 never developed symptoms. So those that were given the vaccine, 80 had no symptoms. Okay, third sentence of those given the placebo, 10 never developed. 
symptoms. So we've given the placebo 10 never developed symptoms. And that is all the information that we were given. So obviously, when you are um, looking at, at this type of problem, you're not going to, to be given all of the information, but you will be given enough information to fill out the table. And uh, filling this out the rest of the way, really, the, uh, it, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. So let's just, I guess, start at the top. Um, so if 100 total were given the vaccine and 80 had no symptoms, then how many that were given the vaccine developed symptoms? Yep, good. Exactly. All right. Then for the placebo, the next box over, uh, next yeah, cell in our table, 50 total were given the placebo. 10 of those individuals did not develop symptoms. So 40 of those did. So the total number of individuals that developed symptoms were 60. And those that did not were 90. And notice when we add those, the 60 plus the 90 is our 150 that did uh, participate in the survey. So that is our table. Okay. Now for the Venn diagram, uh, to make the Venn diagram, what we do is we pick one of the options from the first variable. So we could choose uh, vaccine or placebo. Let's choose vaccine. I'm just gonna choose the first um, here. And then for the second variable, again, we choose one of the two options. So let's choose symptoms. And those are going to be the two sets that we draw in our, uh, in our Venn diagram. Okay, so let's get a fresh page here. Get our Venn diagram set up. It's going to have two sets, again, represented by circles. So you have two circles. The first circle or set was the first thing that we had. So this is going to be vaccine. And then the second set or circle represents the second thing we chose that was symptoms. Now we want to uh, fill in the information for the Venn diagram. So let's look at this, uh, the part where they intersect. Those are individuals that were given the vaccine that developed symptoms. So if we go back to our table, look at how many of the vaccine developed symptoms, there were 20 individuals that did. So we have 20 there. Okay, uh, this part of the Venn diagram, this represents those that were given the vaccine since it is in the vaccine circle, but it is outside of the symptom circle. So it, uh, it is those that did not receive, that had uh, no symptoms with the vaccine. So those that had no symptoms with the vaccine, there were 80 of those. Uh, then this portion are those that did not receive the vaccine, so received the placebo, and develop symptoms. Okay, so that's going to be 40 individuals. And then this last portion right here that is outside of both circles are those that were given the placebo that developed no symptoms. And that is 10. So here is our uh, Venn diagram. Now, You'll notice, and uh, this is why I think the book excludes these, but none of the numbers from the total column and row show up. So we won't have the 60, you won't have the 90 or the 150, you won't have this 50 or this 100, just the other part, the 20, 40, 80, and 10. And those show up there. Okay, all right. So let's go back to our review, uh, make a Venn diagram summarizing the results that is given. How many people who received the vaccine? So our question that we want to answer, how many 
uh, people who received the vaccine developed, uh, not, sorry, received the vaccine did not improve. Okay, uh, questions. Uh, okay, that's a good question. So, so here, um, this this portion of the Venn diagram is outside of both circles. So, uh, it's not inside of the vaccine circle. So that means that uh, uh, those are the individuals that received the placebo, and it is not inside of the symptom circle. Uh, so it is those that had no symptoms. So those combined, those that had the placebo with no symptoms. And when we go back to our table, that's uh, this, this part right here. So there were 10 individuals that were given the placebo that had uh, no symptoms. Okay. All right. Uh, so for Continuing on, hopefully that makes sense. Um, this one, how many people did not improve? So uh, here, notice we are looking at those that did not improve. Oh, good. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, glad that made sense. Okay. Um, when you're when you're looking at answering these questions, you want to tie it back to the um, to the variables that we had. So if, if you remember the variables we had or the answers to the to the questions that were asked. Um, <laughs> on the exit survey, uh, in this case, uh, vaccine or placebo is our first variable. Symptoms or no symptoms is our second variable. So if you did not improve, would that be symptoms or no symptoms? Well, that's going to be you got symptoms. So what this question is asking is how many people received the vaccine and had symptoms? And in this case, that is 20 individuals. Good. Which we can see that from our Venn diagram. And you can use either the Venn diagram or the 2A table to answer that. Uh, but since we have the Venn diagram here, that's what I use. Very good. OK. I'm going to go, let's go to the review sheet then. And again, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask those either in the audio or uh, in chat. I am keeping my eye on chat in case any questions come up. Um, so that was question two. And we could ask a whole, a whole uh, other set of questions involving the Venn diagram. Uh, so if you wanna see some, some other other questions that we could throw into the mix, uh, I would look at the examples that we went over uh, during that lecture. So that was for uh, section 1C, the, the uh, section 1C notes. OK, problem three, we're looking at a deductive argument. So we're given a deductive argument here. So the deductive argument is all Labradors love to swim, Rex loves to swim, Therefore, Rex is a Labrador. That is our deductive argument. We want to discuss the truth of the premises, uh, draw a Venn diagram that represents the relationship between the sets, and put an X where Rex belongs in the diagram. And we want to state whether the argument is valid or not valid, and whether it is sound or not sound. OK. So problem three. So let's write down our argument. So we have premise one is all Labradors love to swim. Love to swim. OK, premise two, we've got Rex loves to swim.
And our conclusion is, therefore, Rex is a Labrador. OK. And so I'm, again, I'm just going to follow from the top to the bottom. First question, discuss the truth of the premises. So premise one, we want to know, is that true or false? And same thing with premise two. Is premise two true or false? So premise one, Labradors love to swim. True or false? Well, honestly, I don't actually know much about Labradors. I'm going to assume that the person making the argument to me is not going to lie. So I'm going to say that's true. Premise two, Rex is a Labrador. I don't know Rex, so I'm going to assume that that is true, that the person making the argument, again, knows Rex knows that Rex loves to swim and is not going to lie to me about that. So in this case, uh, both premises are true. OK, so that was the first part. Second part, draw a Venn diagram that represents the argument. So again, we're using our Venn diagram to analyze the argument. Uh, so premise one. We have all Labradors love to swim. That's all, uh, I don't remember the, don't remember the letters we used, all PRQ or something like that. All Labradors are things that love to swim. Uh, so in this case, that argument, if you recall, is a subset, uh, that relationship is a subset relationship. So we have a, a set and a subset. And let's put that in our universe. And Labradors, that goes, that is the subset. And the bigger set are things that love to swim. So that is premise one as a Venn diagram. So again, the all PRQ is a, a subset relationship. Premise two, Rex loves to swim. <clears throat> so here we want to put uh, an X that represents Rex <laughs> uh, into our Venn diagram. Now, X loves, uh, Rex loves to swim. So we know that it's going to be in the big circle. But we notice that premise two does not say anything about whether Rex is a Labrador or not. So what that means is that uh, Rex could, the X could be in the Labrador set, in the Labrador circle, or outside of it. And since we don't know, we're going to put it on the border. So the X goes on the border because, again, it's unclear uh, from that premise whether Rex is a Labrador or not. It doesn't, doesn't give us that information. And because it could go either way, we put, it, we put the X on the, on the border. So there is our Venn diagram. And we want to know whether the argument is valid and whether the argument is sound. So next we want to know, uh, is the argument valid? Well, to check if the argument is valid, we look at the conclusion. The conclusion is that Rex is a Labrador, so we have our uh, Labrador set, Labrador circle. And the X should be inside of it in order for our conclusion to be true. That's what we want. And does that match with our Venn diagram? In this case, no. It doesn't match because the X could be either inside or outside. It's not guaranteed to be inside. So this is not valid. not a valid argument. <clears throat> Second, is it sound? Is this a sound argument? Sound or not sound?
not sound, is correct. So remember, in order for an argument to be sound, it has to meet, uh, satisfy two conditions. First condition, all of the premises have to be true. That is, that is uh, satisfied, that, that, that condition is satisfied. Condition two, it has to be valid. This is not a valid argument, so this is not a sound argument. Okay, so again, in order for an, a deductive argument to be sound, all of the premises have to be true and it has to be valid. Uh, in this case, it satisfies the premises being true, all of the premises are true, but the second condition there that it, that it is valid is not met. So this is not a sound argument. Excellent, okay, let's go back to our review sheet here. So that was question three. Question four, so question four, we're looking at units. Uh, we wanna decide whether the following statement makes sense or is true, uh, does not make sense, is false. And we wanna explain the reasoning using unit conversions and mathematics. So using our unit con uh, units. So what we are given is the recommended amount of water for an, an, an adult is 64 ounces per day. I like to buy in bulk, so for a week, so for, so for a week, I will need 24 liter. And the note that we're given is that there are 33.8 ounces in one liter. So um, just as before, if you are needing to use a conversion factor, that will be provided in, in the problem itself. All right, so let's write down the information and take a look at what, what, uh, what we have here. So we have two parts uh, to the statement. The first part is that adults need, uh, I lost my place, 64 ounces per day, 64 ounces per day of water, okay? And the second part of the statement is that 24 liters for one week is enough. It's uh, 24 liters per week is enough. Okay. When we are looking at uh, analyzing units like, like this, we want to make sure that the units match. So here we have ounces per day. Here we have liters per week. Those don't match. So just on the outset, we cannot compare these two. So what we have to do is we have to convert, uh, we have to convert them to both be the same unit, uh, in the same units, both for volume and time. Uh, so we have four options here, four natural options. We could do ounces per day. We could do ounces per week. We could do liters per day, and we could do liters per week. And any of those work, um, but I'm just going to pick uh, ounces per week. So let's convert to ounces per week. But again, you can, uh, you can use any of those four, uh, any of those other three options uh, that, I, that I mentioned uh, before, any of those three options will work just as well as long as the units match, that's the important thing. In order to compare, the units have to match. Okay, so let's convert the first one. So we have 64 ounces per one day. We want to get this into ounces per week. So we're converting the uh, time units. So we'll have day on top, week on bottom, and that's so that the days will cancel. And there's seven days per one week. So here the days cancel. And now we use our four function, not four function, our non-programmable calculator. So we do 64 times seven and we get 448. So we have 448 ounces per week. Okay. 
second part, we have 24 liters for one week. So our time units are good. Now our volume units are not. So we want to convert ounces to liters. And that is the note that was given at the end of this problem. So the last sentence on this problem is our conversion factor. So we want uh, liters on the bottom. So that will cancel ounces on the top. And we're told there are 33.8 ounces per one liter. Okay, so the liters cancel. And in this case, we're multiplying again. So we do 24 times 33.8, and we get 811.2 ounces per week. And I have to, I'm sorry. Just that paper so I can finish that that letter. There we go. Ounces per week. Okay. So after we've converted these to the same units, what what uh, the statement becomes is that adults need 448 ounces per week of water, and 811.2 ounces per week of water is enough. Is that true or false? And in this case, that is true. If we need 448 and we have 811, then we have enough. Okay. All right, back to our review page here. So problem five, we're looking at recipe conversions. Uh, so we have uh, given the recipe. Okay, so uh, grandma's cookie recipe is given. So that that is the uh, recipe that I that I posted. We'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, you for the recipe, not for the recipe. Uh, you only have nine eggs. Apologize. I think I think the landscape is here. I don't have any control over that. Um, you have nine eggs and want to make as many cookies as you can. So how many cookies can you make with those nine eggs is the first question. And the second question is find the necessary amount of baking soda. Okay. So let's go to our recipe here. So this is the recipe that is given. Uh, this is the recipe that is being referred to. And again, this is in the, um, this is in the week 15 module. So this is uh, the the directions we don't really need. We're looking at the ingredients since we're looking at um, conversions here. So we note two things. Two two things are important to note. The first is that uh, one batch of these cookies makes twenty four servings, or that is twenty four cookies. We're going to assume that one cookie is one serving. So one one batch of this recipe makes twenty four cookies. The second thing we want to note is because we were given eggs, we want to note how many eggs do we need for one batch. In this case, we need two eggs for one batch. So let's go to our scratch paper here. And my computer has frozen. So let me give that a second. Okay. Uh, let me see if this is still working. Uh, oh, there we go. Nope. Okay. All right. <laughs> Are we still connected? Can you guys still still hear me? And can you see the digital paper? Sorry about that. Question five, one yes, two yeses. Okay, okay, excellent. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so let's let's go ahead and continue then. All right, so um, from this recipe, we noted uh, two things. Uh, we have one batch. 
of the recipe makes 24 servings, so that is 24 cookies, and takes two eggs. Okay, so that we got uh, from the recipe. Now we want to answer the first question. So the first question is, uh, how many cookies can we make given nine eggs? And we're going to assume that all of the rest of the ingredients are freely available, uh, that the only ingredient that we have to worry about are the eggs. Well, if one batch requires two eggs, how many batches of the recipe can we make? So we can make uh, nine out of two or 4.5 batches of the recipe. Since we have nine eggs, each batch takes two eggs so nine divided by two, that's four and a half. Uh, so that is four point five times twenty four. Each batch makes twenty four cookies. So four and a half batches times twenty four. Give us 108 cookies. So we can make 108 cookies using those nine eggs. Okay, that was the first question we were asked. Second question, or second part, uh, find the necessary amount of baking soda. Okay, so we go to our recipe. Uh, that's not the recipe. Where is the recipe? Here we are. Uh, so we go to our recipe here and we look at uh, baking soda. We find how much, how many, uh, what amount of baking soda do we need for one batch of the cookie? And baking soda that is right here, thir uh, second, third to the last. We need one teaspoon. Okay, so we go back to go back to our digital paper. Um, one batch requires one teaspoon of baking soda, and we are making four and a half or four point five batches. So we need four point five times one is four point five or four and one half teaspoons of baking soda. Okay. That is question five. So question five, the first thing we need to do, uh, we needed to do was determine how many batches of the recipe we can make. We can make four and a half batches. Um, and from that, we can determine not only how many cookies we can make from that, but uh, how much of any of the other ingredients we need. Okay, uh, back to our study guide. So that was, that was problem five. So again, that recipe was, was given, that's the uh, recipe. Um, that was posted under the week 15 module. Uh, number six, we're finding absolute and relative change. So we have out of 10,000 teens ages 16 to 18 surveyed in 2008, 555 used marijuana on a regular basis. In 2017, uh, the, same, the same survey recorded 1,000 used the drug. Uh, we wanna find the absolute and relative change between the 2008 and 2017 values. Okay. 
So let's see what we have with that. All right, so that is question, which question are we on? Six, question six. So we have uh, 2008, 555 used marijuana. And in 2017, the number that we got was 1,000. I want to find the absolute and relative change. So absolute and relative. Okay, so for the absolute change, that is going to be the new value minus the old value. So 1000 minus 555. And you can do that in your head if you want, or if you can't do it in your head, that's fine. You can use your calculator. 1000 minus 555, 445. So that is our absolute change, 445 individual. For the relative change, relative change is a percent. So we'll have the old, uh, the new value, sorry, new value minus the old value divided by the old value. And then we want this in percent form because this is a percent, so times 100. Uh, so we get that is 445 divided by 555 times 100. So let's see what we get for that. Divided by 555 times 100. Let's round to two decimal places. So we have 80.18%. Uh, and just as a reminder of this, uh, these are either both positive or both negative. Uh, they're both positive if the number has increased. They're both negative if the number has decreased. So in this case, the, the uh, number of users has increased by 445 or it is, uh, in terms of the relative change, it is increased by 80.18%. 80 80 okay, so that's our absolute change and relative change. Okay, problem seven. We are computing the grade for a, a student in this hypothetical course. Uh, so, Remember how, how we solve this problem is we are thinking of each category of the grade as uh, giving the student a certain number of grade points. And uh, that number is dependent on the weight. So um, in this case, 10% for the homework. And uh, so the first thing we wanna do is find all of the grade points that are contributed to the grade from each category. So let's go to our paper here. So number seven, I wanna find the grade points for homework in particular. You'll notice that the homework is 10% of the grade. So this is going to be 10% uh, of what their score was, their, their average was a 97. So we want 10% of 97. So that is when we take a percent of a number, we take the decimal form of that. So 0.1 times the number. So times 97 Again, use your calculator. 0.1 times 97, we get 9.7. So this, student got 9.7 uh, grade points from the homework category of the grade. And then uh, to find the, the final grade, the cumulative grade, 
uh, you find the number of grade points for each category, you add all of those together, and that is going to be the, the student's cumulative grade. So we continue on. Uh, so we find the grade points for all of the other categories. And here, uh, just as a note, just be careful with uh, what the weight is for each category. Um, in this case, most of them are 10%. The only one that is not is the final, which is 20%. Uh, but just, just be aware that, that uh, just, just be aware of those. What, what is the, uh, the percent, the weight of that? Now, for the sake of time, I'll give you what, the, what you should get for that, so you should get 8.4 for the mini project average. You should get 7.5 for test one, uh, 8.6 for test two, 2.5 for test three, 9.6 for project one, 9.1 .1 for project two, uh, 8.8 .8 for project three, and for the final, remember that's 20%, so that's 0.2 times the 62, which is 12.4. Okay. And so the final grade or the cumulative grade is the sum of all of the grade points. So let's add all of those together, see what we get. Uh-huh, okay. And let's not forget the 9.7 from the homework as well. <laughs> so that was, that's up here on that first line. So we have 9.7 plus 7.5 plus 8.6 plus 2.5 plus 9.6 plus 9.1 plus 8.8 .8 plus 12.4. And I think I missed one. Let me add all of those up. Nine point one, eight point eight. All right. Uh, so you, you should get 76.6%. Uh, I skipped the 8.4. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that what you guys got, the 76.6? .6? Let me just verify with, with you guys, make sure that I didn't miss anything that time. And while you are typing that, that's fine. I'll go to the back to the review page here. All right, so the next part, uh, assume the student has not yet taken the final exam and wants a 70% in the core. What do they need to earn on the final exam to get that grade? Okay. So for the second question here, uh, we're assuming the final is zero above, and what we get are the grade points. Because the final was 12.4 grade points, we just take uh, that off of the sum. So minus 12.6 is 64 grade points. And in order to find what final, what we need to get on the final exam, we would use the equation, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, we would use the equation, the grade points, grade points 
plus 20%, it's 20% for the final. So 0.2 times, let's use variable x equals 70 is what we want to get. And what we had for our grade points was uh, 64. Again, that's without the final. So plus the 0.2 times x equals 70. We want to solve that equation. So we would minus the 64 from both sides, divide by the 0.2. So we have 70 minus the 64, and then divided by the 0.2 is 30, is what we get. So x equals 30 is needed. on the final. Okay. That's question seven. Uh, let's go ahead and stop there for today for the sake of time. Um, what I would recommend you guys do, if, uh, if you have time, uh, is to go through these questions, 8, 9, 10, 11. Go through the rest of these questions. Uh, it might, we might be able to go through all of them, but it might be close. Um, so go through these questions, the remaining questions. Uh, if there are any that you want to see done at the very beginning, just in, in, in the case where we don't have enough time to do all of the questions, uh, let me know at the beginning of class on Thursday, and we'll go through those specific questions, uh, make sure that those specific questions are covered. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we are continuing on Thursday. Uh, sorry, let me go back to the scratch paper here. Uh, so what we get is that a 30% is needed on the final. Um, yeah, so, so go through the, the uh, rest of the study guide. And... Um, I will try. We will try to go through the entire the, the entire review, go through all of the questions. Um, if that is not possible, uh, just at the beginning of class, let me know what questions you want to see done specifically, if you have any. If you don't, that's fine. And we'll go through those at the beginning of class to make sure that I cover those. And then we'll, we'll uh, hit all of the other ones that, that were not there. Um, Okay, so any any uh, last minute questions uh, before I let you guys go? Our final, that's a good question. Let's check when our final is. So uh, for the final, that's on the syllabus. And I'm gonna I'm gonna double check on here as well because I don't want to get the the date confused with one of my other courses. So this is 120 section 1016. Open up the syllabus. Okay, and as soon as that loads, scroll down to the second page, Tuesday, December eighth. So our final is Tuesday, December eighth. Uh, the time, I might have this open. Uh, so as for test three, I think I'll have this available for 24 hours. So available for the 24 hour window to start, but you must do it in two hours in one, in one, uh, one sitting. So when you're ready on the eighth, sit down, log in, uh, we'll, we will be using Web Campus this time because I think Web Campus is a little bit better, uh, a little bit easier to use than, than Pearson was. Um, and once you hit start, you'll have the one sitting to finish the exam. That's the 120 minutes. Obviously, if you finish before then, that's fine, but you will have that, that two hour time. So that will be, uh, be the 8th of December. Uh, any other questions?
Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, you won't have to start exactly at 1. You will have to do it on the 8th. Uh, it will be available for approximately 24 hours. So if you wanted to, you could probably do it at 10 AM <laughs> on the 8th. Uh, but it must be done on the 8th, December 8th. Uh, and it, and it, it will be timed, so it will be a two hour long exam. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to have it available. I will have it available because of because of time zones and all of that. I'm going to have it available to start on December 8th. So as long as you do it on the 8th, you have to you have to start it and finish it on the 8th. It is timed, so you do have two hours when you when you sit down to start. You do. I want to make sure you have that that two hours available for that exam. Um, but uh, I'm not going to be checking when you start, so I'm not going to say start at one p.m. <laughs> Especially with the with the time zones, because I know that that gets a little bit a little bit complicated. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, then we'll go ahead and stop there. So next next class, we'll go over, again, any questions that you have on the review that you want to see in particular. Again, I, I will try to go through all of the questions. I don't know if we'll make it. Um, so we'll start with any of those questions that you have. If not, we'll start on question eight on the review. And that is, uh, just as a reminder, that was under module uh, week 15, I believe. Let me scroll down. The newest module. Yeah, week 15. So the study guide is there. There's the recipe that we did for problem five. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll meet again there. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks for your patience. Thanks for coming. Hope you have a wonderful day. If you do have any questions, you can feel free to email me. That's fine. I'll, I'll answer uh, questions. Uh, I'll answer emails as quickly as I am able to. Um, but uh, if that's everything, then have a wonderful day. I will see you guys on Thursday. I have a quick question for you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, where can we find the links to the um, to the Zoom calls or the Zoom stuff? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that like record. Oh, uh, what was that? Uh, for the ones that you record and stuff. Oh, so okay, that's a good question. Um, so this one, uh, because this is week fifteen, uh, uh, right here on this page. Let me click on that. Am I sharing the the web web campus? Yeah, you're sharing it. Okay, okay. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna appear right here at at the bottom of this. So uh, well, okay, it will be okay. right here, and then once we do the next day, it will be right below that. Um, okay. So yeah, it will be just on that on that page under the week fifteen module. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Yep, no problem. Uh, see you. Yep, have a good day. Thank you.